Denise, are you there? She might not know how to unmute. No, she's unmuted. No, she huh. Okay. She may not have a Okay. Okay, we're going to get started. Okay. Oh, very good. <laughs> Great. All right, so we are ready. Okay. Um, so you don't want to right. Everybody knows you. This is Melissa Spence for those who maybe don't know. <laughs> no, all of you don't know. <laughs> She's here in, in Lewis County. Um, I'm Mike Knuckles. I'm over in Jefferson County, and Sue Wise, our consumer port expert and gardener, master gardener. Leader extraordinaire, um, <laughs> does wonderful things. And so uh, last year we were involved in Ohio University's um, Extension Educator Program for mushrooms. And so I both said, "Oh, we want to do this." And now we're going through the North Country teaching about mushrooms. So we're here in Lewis County today, and we're so happy you guys are here. This is our first live version of this, by the way. We had to do this during the pandemic as a webinar. And January was our first webinar. Um, so we're happy you can actually put your hands on this stuff and play with it. We did give kits last year, but it's not the same as being able to ask questions and, and all that. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into it. And uh, Sue, let me bring up your slides okay. and we'll get started. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to start out, you know, we have to put in some science. We're going to start out with just some basic information about fungi. Then Mike's going to jump in to the whole oyster mushroom thing, show you how to put some kits together. And then I'm going to finish up with some other things, some other mushrooms that you may be able to grow at home or you may want to grow at home. So that's kind of the agenda for tonight. So we go to the next slide, Mike. There we go. Okay. What? Okay. So the mushrooms are actually the fruiting body of a fungus. Uh, the mushroom is, what you see as a mushroom, that's not the bulk of the body of a mushroom. The body of a mushroom is mostly underground and it's made up of mycelium, which are these uh, strands or filaments called hyphae. They mass together, they're called mycelium. And the purpose of the fungus is, is the, of the fruiting body is reproduction. Um, mushrooms introduced by spores, and in order to get those spores up and out in the air where they get blown around, they produce a mushroom. Um, next uh, thing. Okay, I talked about that. Okay, um, so that's oh, that's hyphae magnified. When all the hyphae, these single celled strands join together, you get mycelium. And I'm sure if you've ever been out in the woods up on a dead log, you see this, that's, that's fungal mycelium. Again, here's some on a log, and the result of that are the fruit and bodies for the mushrooms. And by the way, those mushrooms there are oyster mushrooms. We have a native species that raise here. I had some this fall, and they're absolutely delicious. Sorry. That's okay. I, just, I didn't realize that photo was on there. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Okay, so basically the mushroom life cycle, you have the fruiting body or the mushroom releases its spores, hyphae grow, they meet and combine, this creates mycelium, and then you get a primordia that forms that becomes the fruiting body, spores are released, cycle starts all over again. It's basically the same for, for all mushrooms. Um, if you are really, really interested in mushrooms, and there's a, there's a lot of, um, Kind of a lot of hype and a lot of good things going on with mushrooms. This is a really good book. It's called The Entangled Life. And the author is Merlin Sheldrake, which I think is an awesome name for somebody who's <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's gotta be a pen name. I haven't looked into that. But this is this is this is really a really good book. And I'll pass it around in a second after I after I read, read a quote out of her book. Okay, so it, 
cooperative extension. Obviously, we get a lot of calls about people that want to forage for mushrooms. So go out in the wild and look for them. And um, many wild mushrooms are edible. Um, you've probably seen, you've seen or heard of chicken of the woods, morels, puff balls. You know, these are the ones that most people can identify. You can go to the next slide. But there are a lot of poisonous mushrooms. And um, when people call in with mushroom questions, we pretty much say, you know, leave it alone because it's so hard to tell if something is poisonous. And mushrooms, um, nasty mushrooms are categorized as hallucinogenic, poisonous, or deadly. So any one of those, you don't want to get into, into any of that. The Ammonata death cap, bring up a picture here of it. It looks like, you can go to the next slide, looks like a grocery store mushroom. Mm -hmm. mushrooms, you know, easily mistaken, um, except for this, this little thing that it has here on the bottom, which is sometimes indicative of the poison. But if you eat just a tiny bit of this, you will die within 10 days in mushroom treatment. So this is why we, uh, we don't encourage foraging. So it's, you can get all kinds of mushroom books for ID. It's really hard to tell them apart. These ID books will tell you what's edible and what isn't. But the best way to uh, ID a mushroom is through a spore print. You basically cut off the cap of the mushroom, lay it on a white piece of paper, let the spores come out, and you're left with a spore print. And depending on the arrangement of that spore print, the colors of the spores, that's one of the better ways to identify mushrooms. And of course, that takes some time. And by the time it releases its spores, if it was edible, it's, you know, the population's probably gone because they're so short lived. So if you're going to forage for mushrooms, take it to my colleagist with you so you know what you're doing, somebody who has a lot of experience with that. Another thing we like to talk about about mushrooms and I didn't know this until we took the mushroom course that Mike talked about. And I don't think Mike knew it either. No, I didn't. Um, all mushrooms oh. should be cooked for eating. Oh, really? So mm -hmm. here I was for years and years buying the, the mushrooms know, that were for the thing. salad. Yeah. yeah. Did you buy in the store? For a wonderful thing. Well, mm -hmm. you go to the next one. The cell walls and mushrooms are and it's really difficult to digest. To digest. Oh, I saw you the mushrooms you buy in the store. <laughs> so go ahead, Mike. I think somebody had a question. Okay, also, when you cook mushrooms, it releases all those beneficial nutrients. So you probably heard about all the good things that are in mushrooms. Uh, you can't take advantage of those unless you cook them first. So the common button mushroom contains hydrazine, which is generally considered carcinogenic. But <laughs> the hydrazine is heat sensitive and it's volatilized by cooking. So as long as you cook the mushroom, it's safe. Even oysters and morels can make you sick if they are eaten raw. So, the poisonous mushrooms, if you cook those, it's not gonna render them not poisonous. Okay, so cooking is not the miracle of poisonous mushrooms. So just keep that in mind, you have to say that. So as a result of all of this that I just spoke about, it's easier just to grow your own. Because if you get the kits, like the materials we've given you today, you know exactly what it is, it's sterile. You don't have to worry, you know, if it's safe or not. And there are different kinds of kits available. Um, this is, these are shiitake mushrooms. You can buy blocks um, that have been inoculated. And you just cut holes in them. Mushrooms come out. And this is some spawn, which you're going to be, if you've got your kits, you're going to be working with in a minute. Um, so it's much easier to do your own thing with these. So let's just talk about oyster mushrooms, just a little bit of background really quick. Um, like Mike said, you can go to the next slide. They grow wild. 
throughout North America. And it's basically a wood, wood decomposer. A lot of fungi, that's their job. They break things down, get rid of all the, the, the natural wastes in the environment. But they do grow on tree stumps, um, usually willow or aspen. But sometimes they're found buried underground on decomposing stumps. And they generally fruit in the spring and in the fall. They're used in bioremediation. Go to the next slide, which um, means that they can degrade environmental toxins. And I just want to read you something rather interesting from this book here. In Mexico City, they use diapers. Um, there were five to fifteen percent weight in weight of solid waste. Okay. And they inoculated them with oyster mushrooms. And the oyster mushrooms grew heavily on a diet of used diapers. Over the course of two months, the diaper is introduced to the oyster mushrooms lost 85% of their starting mass when the plastic covering was removed, compared to a mere 5% in fungus-free controls. And what's more, the mushrooms that were produced were healthy to eat and free from disease. I'm not saying you should eat mushrooms grown up during diapers, but it just shows you the potential uses there are for mushrooms in the future. Um, oyster mushrooms do have a longer shelf life than most mushrooms, so that's a bonus. They're high in protein and B vitamins. They have significant levels of lovastatin, which is a cholesterol lowering material molecule. It supposedly improves anti-cancer responses, and there's potential benefits uh, for breast and colon cancer. But again, they have to be cooked in order to get these benefits. And 140 degrees is the temperature that, that they have to go to in order to release all of these. Okay, so now I'm gonna let Mike take over, switch places here, and Mike's gonna bring up this presentation and now we're going to get into the fun, the fun how to do stuff here. So I'll, pass, I'll pass this around. You guys want to take a look at this? Share screen. There we go. All right. So oyster mushrooms are one of my favorite mushrooms to eat. And to grow because they're they're very easy to grow. Mike, do you want me to hit the button or uh, I got it. easier? Okay. okay. And uh, so I'm going to go through very. Once I get the slides working, go through uh, some of the basics on growing oyster mushrooms. Um, they're to me they're a good beginner mushroom because they're tolerant of a wide variety of conditions. A wide variety of substrates. They'll grow on pretty much anything with wood in it. Paper. Um, I've seen demonstrations where people use toilet paper. Uh, the, the one I love is the book that's being passed around. Somebody grew oyster mushrooms from the book itself, um, <laughs> which I think is a waste of a good book. Yeah. But still, it was an interesting photograph. And there are a lot of different things that, that you can use to do that. So if you've got trees on your property, uh, some waste trees like willow and things like that, those are a good source of the, the wood chips. Um, if you've got certain types of waste scrap paper, clean cardboard, um, coffee grounds, things like that, you can use that as the carbon source as well. So they're really cool in that regard in that they recycle waste into something absolutely delicious. I use them all the time. I've grown them since basically so when I started this course and I've continued growing them. I sold some at a farmer's market in Watertown this summer and uh, they were very well received at the farmer's market. Um, in fact, I couldn't grow enough of them and people really, really wanted them. Um, so I think from a culinary perspective, they're well worth growing. From a horticultural perspective, they're super, easy to go. There, but there are going to be some tricks and some things that you need to know about as we talk about oyster mushrooms. 
So the basic steps for cultivation, um, you're gonna get a container and you're gonna get some spawn. So Melissa got you guys spawn in your kits and the spawn we'll talk about in a second, but this is the grain spawn. And you can see the white of this. This one's been in my refrigerator for a while. And so it's been growing out the bottom. So you can really see this beautiful white mycelium that started growing. That's a little bit younger. So the mycelium isn't quite as far along. When you get it home, put it in a refrigerator, get a hold for, this has been in my refrigerator since June, July, something like oh. that. Go hold for a while. Uh, you shouldn't keep it that long. They're not as vigorous, but if you do, you'll still get mushrooms. So still use it. So we're going to use some of this tonight. And I'm going to send Melissa away with some yellow for mushrooms. <laughs> so the second thing, so once you get your containers to put it in, you're going to get a substrate. And like I said, um, this can be anything. And when we did these slides, these slides are actually a little bit old. I should have updated it for this. When we did this a year ago, we included straw in the kit and our sense experimented more with the wood pellets, which you guys have as well. Um, wood pellets are really cool because they're, they're nice hardware. They're exactly what these things love. And the manufacturing process on the wood pellets um, sterilizes them in the beginning. So they're pretty easy to use. But we'll talk about other ways to sterilize the substrate. So if you do use coffee grounds or things that leaves from your yard, things like that, there are going to be some steps you need to do to kill any competing fungi that are in there. Because these are pretty vigorous, but just like weeding a garden, you gotta get the weeds out as well. So you're gonna inoculate that substrate. So basically you're gonna make lasagna between this and whatever you're using for a substrate. You make sure it has plenty of moisture, oxygen. So just like people, these things eat carbon. We eat sugars and carbohydrates and good stuff like that. So they are respiring and using oxygen just like we are. So they need oxygen during the growth cycle. And it's kind of interesting, people growing in basements and stuff, they'll actually find that oyster mushrooms, they'll start stretching and extending and doing weird things when oxygen levels get low, even like 2% lower than normal. So for some indoor applications, ventilation becomes a thing. Um, you wait for penning. So this thing, the, the mycelium will begin growing and stretching through whatever's there. It's going to go find its food source, grow through it, do the cell walls, and it'll turn into this brilliant white mass. And once it's colonized the entire mass, it's then ready to fruit. It'll go, hey, I'm out of food. I better... I better make some babies. I better throw some spores off. So it's time to have some mushrooms to go to the next delicious meal somewhere else. Um, so you wait for what's called penning and you make sure there's plenty of humidity. You keep the pens moist so that they can continue growing uninterrupted. And then you have mushrooms. And this happens very quickly. Um, summertime is really the best time to grow these without intervention. Wintertime indoors, you're going to have to do a little bit more. But in summertime, I use a bucket method. And I've gone out one day and nothing. And the next day, there's these giant oyster mushrooms waiting in me. So where the, the mushroom gods have, have smiled on me. <laughs> um, they're really, really amazing. And the cool thing about these is once you get a substrate inoculated, you can let them rest go for four to six weeks. Um, first few steps take about six weeks. Let them rest, go another six weeks, and they'll flush again. And you can get two or three flushes from the, the first inoculation. They'll be less because they've eaten all their food, so they're not going to put out quite as much, but you'll get some more out of it. The key thing in all of this is sanitation. So Imagine you've got a beautiful buffet and you've got it set up and um, there's some birds circling, some vultures and packs of dogs nearby and squirrels and everything else that wants to eat it. And uh, so that's kind of like all the fungi, the spores that are floating in the air. So if you don't do something to protect that, those other things are gonna come in and eat that buffet. So you have to exclude it somehow. Um, you have to make sure they're not there to begin with 
You have to weed them out through a sterilization process, pasteurization actually, and then inoculate it with your preferred fungi, in this case, oyster mushrooms, let them grow and do their thing. Um, and then, then of course you get to treat. So the cleaner you do this, the better. Now this isn't surgery. You don't have to act like you're in an operating room or something. Um, just like in a garden, you're gonna get a few weeds in there anyway, regardless. And that's gonna happen. So there's kind of a risk reward though. If you're too sloppy, you might as well throw it out. But if you're spending a lot of time and energy on sterilizing everything and using a pressure cooker, doing all these things, you'll get a great batch of mushrooms because it's worth all the energy that went into it. So you gotta kind of make that decision. How important is it, is it to you to have absolute guaranteed success? So the, uh, the more sterile you are, the more you're going to guarantee your success, basically. But you don't have to be. If you see some of the conditions I grow mushrooms in, I've got a woodshed, some buckets hanging from the ceiling. I had goats in there a couple of years ago. This is outdoors. I still get mushrooms out of it. Um, in the winter time, it's a little bit different because it's not an ideal environment. So you have to be a little more cautious in growing in the winter. That said, we had some participants last year who, when they packed their mushroom kits, they did it in a burn. And of course, you can imagine all the things that are floating in a burn. And so they had a green contamination that came in that ate the mycelium for the oyster mushrooms. Well, they didn't get oyster mushrooms. So sometimes if, you're, if you are too lackadaisical with sterility, and sanitation, it will bite you. So that's just what is your risk and reward for doing that. Um, so for me, I'm pretty, I'm okay with not getting mushrooms. Sometimes batches screw up and you have contamination. Uh, if, if for you guys, you can make that decision on how important it is that you, you get mushrooms. And so what you put into it is what you're gonna get out. So grain spawn, um, this is what you've got here. We'll talk about this in more detail. So what they start with is barley, in this case, they cook it just enough to soften it. They let it cool, and then they'll take a liquid culture. They'll put this in a jar, they'll autoclave it. So basically pressure cooker, um, they'll let it cool. They'll inject some of that liquid culture into it. It grows, they break it up, they sell it to you through the and this is available from a variety of different sources. Melissa got yours from uh, Field and Forest. There's a guy in Natural Bridge uh, in Jefferson County that started selling it. I don't know how often he has it, so mail order may be the more reliable source. Um, but for beginners, it's pretty easy because you're not dealing with liquid culture and things like that. When you inoculate the grain to make this, you really do need to be very sterile because a few cells of anything, because this has to grow quite a long time. So if you get something in there, eh, it's probably gonna ruin it. Um, versus the actual inoculated mushroom kit with your wood pellets where you're growing them, this is gonna be very vigorous versus a tablespoon of liquid culture and grain, it's not going to be so big. Making the stuff is a course of its own. We're not gonna go into detail about it. Um, one of those have a lot of resources on how to do this. I don't recommend that you guys do it as a beginner. Just buy the grain spawn. It's cheap, it's easy to get, and it'll give you better results initially. So the grain spawn, basically you sow this kind of like a seed. You're not sowing seeds, it's not a seed, but you've got live mycelium in there that goes into your substrate. Um, it comes in different species and colors. So like I said, I've got, this is a golden oyster mushroom here. Um, it's a tropical variety, like some more temperatures, and I've got a summer white variety. That's more like what we have as a native type around here. Each species has different cultural requirements. So we're talking oysters today, but they're king trumpet oyster mushrooms. Uh, we soon, well, soon grew with some beautiful lion's mane. Mine didn't turn out quite as good as yours did, but um, I struggled with them a bit more. And there's some other types of mushrooms that you can get in this grain spawn. 
So you have to read up on the cultural requirements or the substrate requirements to figure out exactly the kind of mushroom you want to grow, what it needs to grow off of. Um, the key thing is don't open this stuff until you absolutely need it, though, because you want to keep this as sterile as possible. So not opening it, don't play with it, um, don't expose it. That's a good way to keep this healthy and safe until you're ready to use it. So the variety that um, Melissa got was Grey Dove, which is a, a nice, tasty, easy to grow variety. And uh, it's one that I really like. Um, you do keep this refrigerated. So this is a living organism and it's gonna keep growing and it's gonna eat this grain. You wanna slow it down until you're ready to use it. So you put it in the refrigerator and it will hold for a number of months. Like I said, this is, I bought this in June, uh, June, July, something like that. And it's still pretty healthy. It's still growing pretty well. So substrate, this is the, the food that those mushrooms, the mycelium, are going to consume. And for oyster mushrooms, they're very, like I said, very tolerant of a variety of different substrates. So we're using, for the kits, we're using the wood pellets. Our wood pellets are great, it's what they love, but there are other things you can use as well. So this is stuff I pulled out of my garden last year. There were corn stalks in there, um, a lot of high nitrogen stuff. And uh, if you do use a lot of green like this, the high nitrogen sources, it will be more susceptible to contamination. Because there are other things that love to eat this nitrogen, much more so than the oysters. But the additional nitrogen will give a boost to the oysters though. So again, there's a trade-off in some of this as to what you do. Um, I did get a beautiful flush off of this. This was just simple garden waste. Uh, that I grew mushrooms in. So basically your substrate is going to be any carbon source of plant that provides food for the fungal colony. Some mushroom varieties are very particular. These oysters are not, which makes them fun because you can use pretty much anything. So my pressure cooker is what's shown here. And uh, I don't normally recommend using cabbage, but I had some. Um, coffee grounds. I had some stuff I just wanted to get rid of because I was playing and I got oyster mushrooms out of this. It was a bit of a soupy mess, I'll admit, but I got oysters, oyster mushrooms out of this. Wood pellets, leaves, dried glass, clip, clippings, toilet paper, brown cardboard, cotton. I've seen people use old pairs of jeans, so they'll cut some of the stuff out of it and leave the, the jeans behind. Hardwood, sawdust, weeds. Um, you do want to use fresh materials. You don't want to use anything that's already been eaten. So if it's already been colonized by fungus, they've stripped the goodies out of it. There's no nutritive value for that. So you want to use fresh materials. You don't want to use stuff that's basically already rotted. Um, if you're growing indoors, I, I was doing a lot outside. It's outside, you can just really play. If you're doing stuff indoors, you do want to use stuff that's a little drier. Just because of the stink factor, and because these will be exposed to the air, um, you're not going to kill all the bacteria. So there, there could be a little bit of smell if we start using too many interesting things other than <laughs> dry brown sources of carbon. So what you're going to do is first cut the substrate into small pieces. Now, wood pellets are great because they're already that size. And we really like using them for beginners for that reason. But if you do gather stuff from your yard, um, you want to basically chop it up. Uh, for, if you're using straw, you can run it through a chipper shredder, uh, run a little lawnmower over, just to get the particle size down to a couple inches, fairly small. So just like chewing your food, getting the particle size down helps the mushrooms to colonize faster. Now, people do grow oyster mushrooms on solid wood, on wood logs and stuff, and they take longer to produce, and that's okay. It's a different method. We're not gonna teach that today, but it is one way to go about doing it. But for this, using the bag method, really cutting it up, smaller pieces will give you better results faster. Faster growth means less chance for contamination to come in and other competing organisms 
to meet your my ceiling, to eat the goodies. Um, garden shears, if you're doing a small project, could be fine, just might be very tedious. To the next step is to make sure that all the bad guys are gone. And wood pellets uh, are easy because when they manufacture these, they put them through a hydraulic press, the lignin explodes, it all joins together, is heated to a high temperature, and they're sterilized, and then they're put cool and put in a bag ready to go. If you gather sawdust from outside, um, you gather stuff from your kitchen, like I did, so coffee grounds, that sort of thing. Uh, don't go too crazy with some of this other stuff. You want brown materials, wood, lignin, is what you really want. But some of these other things, you do need to make sure they're sterile. Because if you're bringing in other species, they'll contaminate the grow. They can outcompete the oyster mushroom mycelium and cause a failure in the growth. So what you can do when you use these is to pasteurize the substrate. And there are a couple of ways of doing this. So you want to kill it. Um, it doesn't mean it needs to be sterilized, but you need to get 90% of the, the bad guys out. This can be done by boiling or steaming as one method. Um, prolonged soaking in super hot water. So think about safe cooking temperatures with pork or chicken or something. If you cook it to that temperature to kill the bacteria, right? They call fungus and whatever else is in it. So if you hold your, your uh, substrate at 160 degrees for four hours, you're gonna kill most everything. That's a good way to pasteurize it to get it ready for use. Pressure cooking is a fast and easy way um, the bags that you guys have. When you fill these, this will fit in an Instapot. So I don't know how many of you use an Instapot. I love mine. Yeah, they're great. So throw it in there, uh, sterilize it, and then you're going to inoculate it with the grain so Let it cool, obviously. So that's a fun and easy way to do it. Um, fermentation is another method, submerging it in water for five to ten days. It's a weird method, but I know people that do this and swear by it. Um, I personally haven't experimented with it yet, and I think someday I will. Chemical sterilization is common, so the use of hydrated lime, it has to be a low magnesium lime, so you gotta watch the kind that you get. Um, but that can be used to chemically sterilize and prepare a substrate. So let's say you're doing 50 gallons worth of substrate, you're doing commercial mushrooms, you're doing a lot. Well, you're gonna, Pressure cooking is probably not going to be great for that. But this method may be a way to do it. And, and like I said, the commercially made wood pellets are, are basically sterile to begin with. So they're a good source for the gears. So hot water pasteurization. So this is one example. Um, they basically take a uh, large bag, in this case, straw. So barley straw, put it in a, a big wire basket. Heat that water up to 150 degrees, soak it in there for an hour, and then go, you're ready to go. Um, you're ready to, to uh, the, so turkey fryer with a barrel could be a way to do bigger projects if you're thinking of doing a commercial type operation. Or maybe if you're at home and you just really love mushrooms. <laughs> Different containers can be used um, to contain the substrate and to grow the mushrooms. So we are using these bags, but this is one I was actually just trying to be cheap and expand some grain. So I had some old oatmeal and put it in there. Well, before I knew it, I had mushrooms popping out the top of this little jar. Not the best situation because it's they it was an interesting experiment, I'll just say that. But I had forgotten about it, and mushrooms were popping off the top and they actually sat there and dried out. So you can do this in many different containers. Um, this is a little quart jar, uh, five gallon buckets. I'll show you in a few another way to do this. The thing about containers is you need to think about contamination. So this had a lid on it that was uh, with a filter patch on it. Um, and I opened it up to allow the mushroom to grow once I saw it was penning. But if you had an open container, and you're allowing whatever's in the air to come in, that increases the risk of contamination. So we're gonna seal, or at home, um, you might wanna seal your bags with a heat sealer 
until you're ready to, uh, for, until panning and the, the mushrooms are ready, at which point we'll cover that. But do think about sources of contamination in the air and how to contain that and prevent it from getting in the cell. So if you do five gallon buckets, they should have lids. Uh, other creative solutions I've seen, um, ice cream tubs. Um, so if you have a bunch of five gallon ice cream tubs around, use those. There are a lot of different ways you can do this in a home environment. They do need drainage. Some of the failures that I've seen are where the water has been allowed to pool in the bottom of the container. And so one of the, the methods to pasteurize, right, is to soak stuff in water because it kills fungi. Well, it'll kill the oyster mushrooms just as well if they're wet and soggy. So you do want to make sure you have good drainage and ventilation. Ventilation is important too because, like I said, like us, they need oxygen, right? So there needs to be holes in the container, but not so much that stuff can get into it. Which is why many people use these grow bags. So um, these are in your kit. These are very commonly used in commercial operations. When you purchase a pre-established block, a mushroom block, this is what they're going to send you. And this little filter patch right here is what allows the mushroom to breathe. So you seal it. No bad guys can get in, right? Put your substrate in, you inoculate it, you do the thing, seal it. The mushrooms breathe through the patch. And then when they've colonized, when it's a nice, white, beautiful body, you cut holes in it, mushrooms pop out of the holes. And that's the most dangerous time, though, because it's when they can dry out. Um, ideally, like I said, you should seal these with a sealer. But if you really have to use a paper clip or something, that's fine. That's fine. It's not ideal. If you do sterilize, these bags can be used in a pressure cooker. <laughs> so you can put your media in here. Don't close it. Put it in the pressure cooker. Sterilize whatever it is you're growing on. Let it cool. Get down to room temperature. And then just barely open it. Put your substrate in. Shake it around a little bit. Mix it up. Seal it for good. And you've got a grow wall, basically. Any questions so far? Yeah. Pressure cook at what? How many pounds for how long? Uh, 10 pounds. What I do is about 10 pounds for um, 10 minutes. And that's probably overkill. So I, I think um, I'm overly cautious when I'm using pressure cooker. Because usually I'm using something I probably shouldn't. Because <laughs> it's got too much nitrogen or something in it. Uh, but, but I like to play. So. Um, I say 10 pounds for about 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there are actually numbers in the, the handouts, too. Okay. What about the Instapot? Yeah, the Instapot, um, so that pressure cooker cooks to 15 PSI, and it, or roughly thereabout. Um, it will definitely sterilize stuff in about the same time period. So if you bring it up to pressure, it'll be just fine. So high pressure mode, um, 10 minutes, minutes. be great. So that will absolutely work for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I love my spot. Mm -hmm. My cat loves it too. The other day, she decided to grab the cord, so the whole Instapot flying, oh, yeah. and uh, it's actually cracked, and the oh. pot of it was dented. So one little kitten that weighs less than the Instapot. <laughs> there you go. She is, she's a, she's a So this is an example of a different container um, and a different method of doing oyster mushrooms. And so this is more of a commercial scale setup. So little bags, kind of for home, having fun. Um, if you want to grow mushrooms to sell, or you just really like them, a lot of people use these straw logs. And basically, big long tubular bag um, that you stuff full with sterilized media. So they're typically using a chemical sterilization. So straw, uh, wood pellets, whatever. Filled with this, you layer it like lasagna, substrate, 
spawn, substrate spawn, substrate spawn, and you seal the top with a metal ring. So the kind of the ones like you use for salsa or something. Um, although it's less tie would work, not quite as well as this, but metal rings would be best. And you go hang it up somewhere and you let it do its thing. Um, these are a little more sensitive if you get them too big. So again, these things breathe, they need oxygen, and you're gonna have to put some holes in it from the outset for that reason. Um, basically at this spacing, there's a good guide on this fresh cat mushroom site on how to do this. You punch holes in it to allow them to breathe and uh, they do fine. But if you get too big beyond about 18 inches, what happens is oxygen doesn't get to the middle and it just gets, the substrate's wasted. So you don't want to exceed too thick of the diameter when doing these larger bags. Um, you do want to put these in a place with high humidity when you do them. So we're going to talk about some of the cultural requirements. Uh, just like plants that need a certain amount of sunlight and humidity, mushrooms do need humidity when they're growing, um, when they're pinning out because it'll dry out pretty fast. So think back to the photo I showed you that mason jar. That one dried out because I forgot about it. How long did it take to dry it out? It, it formed in about a day and it dried out in about eight hours later. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they'll, they'll do that pretty yeah. fast. And when they're pinning, if they dry out, they'll do what's called a wart. So you don't get a mushroom when they wart. They dry out while they're babies, essentially. Different method, and this is the one that I love doing, is using five gallon buckets. You drill half inch holes, um, try and clean up the holes as much as you can. I had an issue this summer where I had some mushrooms that there's this little tiny piece of plastic that was hanging on the edge of it. And when you harvest the mushroom, you cut it off. The plastic went with it, I didn't see it. I'm like, what is that bit? It was a green bucket. What is that green thing in the mushroom? So a little bit grossed out until I realized exactly what it was. It was that. So make sure you kind of clean those holes out. Should be a clean bucket. All of your containers should be sanitary and clean. Clean them out with alcohol, sterilize them as best as you can. If it contained chemicals, eh, you're growing food. So you probably want to think twice about that. Um, you do want to pack these fairly tightly. Um, the mushrooms will consume stuff as they, they consume the mycelium. And you'll actually see the contents of these drop a little bit as they eat, respire throw all the carbon dioxide off, you're losing volume um, of the mass. So the tighter, the better on these. Um, put a lid on it, because you don't want the stuff coming in, and hang the bucket. <laughs> and this is what you get. So this was my first bucket experiment, a recycled bucket. This one had been a bucket for my garden that I'd used for many, many years, so it wasn't breaking chemicals in it. Um, but this was all of that corn and weeds and other stuff. They were sterilized in a pressure cooker, put in this bucket, and this is what I got. And they were absolutely delicious. So first mushrooms were always the best. How wet should the substrate be? Um, basically, you don't want it soaking with water, because like I said, you can sterilize it. But they need enough moistness to grow. So think of a sponge that needs to be damp, but you don't want it to be effectively. So once you've sterilized or pasteurized your substrate, um, cooled it, you've got it ready to go, you've got your spawn, you're going to make the lasagna. Wash your hands. So think COVID. We're doing all this stuff to keep COVID from spreading. You need to make sure you're not spreading bad mushrooms at the same time. Wash your hands, do whatever you can for sanitary reasons. Um, don't do it in your barn where stuff is flying every which way. Um, you need to do it in a fairly sterile, clean environment. So this classroom is great because we don't have horses kicking out. But I don't know where, I don't know what you got to <laughs> so, so. And you're gonna crumble it into the substrate as you go. And um, it's kind of your choice how much to use. Uh, I like to be a little more generous with mine, but you can use less. It eventually will colonize. The thing to keep in mind is the longer it takes to grow, 
the more chance that the bad guys will win. So if you have a lot of good guys to begin with, they'll colonize and make mushrooms for you. If you put just a little bit in there because you want to spread one of these bags over, let's say five five gallon buckets or something, it'll work, it'll grow. But you may have, you have an increased risk of other things growing with the trichoderma um, being one. So once you're done, try and do this quickly, close the container, seal it up. So in the case of the bag, use your, your sealer and seal it up as quickly as you can. You're gonna put your oyster mushrooms in a location where the temperature for this particular, actually this particular variety, um, between 45 and 70. So cool winter house is just fine. Uh, they'll do well for that. The incubation will take about a week and a half to three weeks. And the participants we had last year doing this, um, we were getting pictures and stuff from people. We encourage you guys to send the stuff to uh, as people were growing my ceiling. People, and I'm always amazed how quickly this stuff grows. You go one day and there's not much there. The next day you see this white spidery mass and, and it quickly fills the air. Uh, it, it's just absolutely amazing. So once it turns basically solid white and starts looking like this, um, it's ready to fruit, essentially, as a solid mass, because it's out of the food that it needs. And penning is going to occur on wherever there's oxygen. So with the bags, you're going to take this and so you got this thing filled up. Um, you sealed it up here. Your patch is exposed so that it can get oxygen. It turns white, you're going to cut little X's in a couple places on each side, and these expand quite a bit. So you do one on the sides. That oxygen will trigger the mushroom to go, hey, there's an opening there. And that's where the mushrooms will begin pinning, and those pens will then grow into your mushrooms. As that pinning occurs, they cannot dry out. So you may want to get a spray bottle if you're indoors. So wintertime is the hardest thing because our what's our relative humidity in our houses? Mine's probably like 30% or some incredible way, way, way lower than it wouldn't be normal. Um, so you can use a tent, a plastic bag over it, loosely tented, it needs oxygen to help conserve and create, conserve humidity and create a microclimate. You can spray the pens as they're pinning, just to miss them. A lot of different ways they can do that. There was one of the ladies last year, she had a, a nebulizer that she put right <laughs> next to. She wanted mushrooms and she had beautiful mushrooms from doing that. She grew them out in January, right during, uh, we had 20 below or one of those North country days and when wood stoves going and the house is dry. And she was determined, she was gonna get mushrooms. So she put it in the bathtub, she put that nebulizer spray next to it, and they it worked out great. Summertime when you do this, when it's 70 degrees with 80% relative humidity, you don't have to worry about it. Wintertime, it's, it's something indoors, you gotta do it. If you have a warm basement or something that's more humid, it might be a better spot for this. So 50 degrees, it'll take longer for it to grow, but they won't dry out quite as quickly. What's your relative humidity in your house? You got it right. You could. Yep. <clears throat> so anything you can do to keep that humidity up when you're doing the videos. Um, I, I grow most of mine in the summertime and I freeze them for that reason, just because I, I get busy in the wintertime with other products, like seed starting and stuff, and they take, tend to take care of themselves in the summer. Everyone's favorite part is the harvest. So they can be harvested at any time after the caps are formed. And this happens quickly, um, especially if it's warm out, perfect conditions. I had some this fall, perfect mushroom, oyster mushroom weather, temperature was dropping, the mushrooms were gone. Oh my goodness, winter's coming, we need to reproduce quickly. And I went out one day and I had these giant mushrooms popping out of the bottom of the bucket. Um, they weren't there the previous day. So you do have to watch these or you will miss your mushrooms. They can turn very quickly as well. So what happens, so they'll come out, they'll, they'll pin, they'll grow, 
And these caps begin turning upwards. As they turn upwards, that means they're beginning to release spores into the air for reproduction. And they're past their prime for eating. They're still edible, they're just not perfect. So you wanna catch them when they're still kind of this cup shape and then harvest them then. Usually if they've already formed this, it's time to pick them. If you're asking, should I pick it yet? The answer is yes, in almost all cases. Um, if, you, if you think they're big enough to eat, eat them, because in a day they will quickly begin their reproductive process. You can try and slow the penning stages a little bit by using putting them in a colder spot. Um, I, I've played with it. I, I, I think it works a little bit, but we're not talking significantly. We're talking like lunch to dinner time or something. So um, after they fruit, don't throw it out. Get ready for more because they will rest. They'll come back and they'll send a second flesh out. And if you're lucky, a third. The deteriorated blocks beyond fruiting, they're going to feel spongy because they've eaten all the goodies in it. You can then take that out and put it on your compost pile. And if you're lucky, it'll colonize the compost pile and you'll get more mushrooms. I've talked to people that that's happened as well. Depends on what's in the compost pile too. So what to do when you have too many of them. Um, and like I said, these things have a habit of when the mushroom gods smile upon you, they tend to smile upon you all at once. So if you're doing five gallon buckets or something, you may have a lot of buckets of mushrooms in a few days. And what do you do with them? Uh, for a few days, put them in a paper bag in your refrigerator to keep them from drying out. Kind of when you bring them home from the supermarket, same thing. Drying them in a dehydrator is another option for you. And they rehydrate beautifully. Um, I use them in stir fries after doing that. And you can make powders, hormone soups, whatever the case may be. You can do a quick blanch on them and freeze them. It's an interesting method. Um, I think it's a lot of work, but probably no more work than drying those. And But they turn out fine doing that as well. Give them away, obviously. Or my favorite method, sell them. Because people will find them. So business opportunities, and we always like pushing this. So there is a demand for specialty mushrooms. People have an interest in these. So Sue talked about the health benefits of these. Uh, they People love them, they taste good. A lot of vegans like them as a meat alternative, uh, vegetarians, vegans. And local markets, basically a true four ounce flat will sell for about five bucks at our farmers markets. I'm selling mine, which is about three ounces for three or four dollars because the price point for water time markets. But people don't hesitate to buy these. And I, before I grew them myself, I didn't hesitate to buy them and I understand why, because they're, they're delicious. Restaurants uh, will buy them as well. So one of the um, the statement below that no one growing mushrooms in Jefferson County is an old slide. We have one mushroom grower and he is selling to restaurants. You know, because these, they, they, sh they hold fine, but they don't ship real well because they are a little bit delicate. So restaurants really like these, but they're not able to get them commercially. They can't come from California and hold to two weeks. They'll hold for four or five days. Um, Pennsylvania growers who do button mushrooms aren't growing these either. So there really is a pent up demand for these among restaurants. There's a couple down in Oswego who've been growing these for years, Gavins, and they sell theirs to restaurants in Syracuse on from three and five kind of flats. And they've had a pretty good audience for selling these for many years. Um, we do have, like I said, one grower in Jefferson County. I'm not aware of anybody in Lewis County. There's one person that kind of does it off and on up in St. Lawrence County. And the next closest would be Galvin's in last week. Um, and I want to say they're, I can't remember the town they're in, but they're in the southern part of Las Vegas. So as far as growing these commercially, there's not a lot of competition. And I do recommend it. Problems. So outdoors, there are things called <laughs> fungus dance. And this is where you get into sterilization. You're killing insects too, whatever eggs and stuff are in there. 
Um, if you lay the, an open top, they'll lay their eggs, they'll eat your mycelium, you don't get mushrooms. So keep your containers closed, sanitation. Contamination from mold and other fungi. Uh, one in particular, um, so I'm having a blank on the green one that contaminated. No, oh, yeah, the evil green one. Yeah, the evil green yeah. one. Um, I can't, it's just the evil. Yeah, so anyway, there's an evil green one that, that looks like blue cheese mold, basically. Uh, and it is, if you see it, your mushroom grows basically down and start over, start re sterilize and start again. Uh, and it does happen. It's not the end of the world, just like weeds in a garden or gophers eating off your, your lettuce or something. Um, these things happen. A common thing, and I've had this happen, is the, the pens dry out. So that's back to that humidity. You need to, to relook that. Low or freezing temperatures, if you're doing outdoors, um, that will delay the growth. But some of these varieties, the one that you have can be frozen. Just means that it's not gonna pen and do this thing until springtime. So if you wanna do these outside, go for it. It'll be fine. So be patient if it's been cold. Bad smells and decayed contamination. Um, that's bacterial, other stuff that's gotten in. So just kind of watch that. If you're not smelling something, it, a good scent is a nice earthy mushroomy scent. Um, and, and I don't know a better way to describe it. The forest, the forest after a rainfall. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Whereas if you're smelling sour, rotting meat, that's bad. There's something wrong with it. So other projects with oyster mushrooms, logs from low quality hardwood species are an option. We're not gonna talk about that today, but Sue and I have resources from Cornell that can kind of guide you through that. Um, coins of wood, they're things called totems. So you take a log, you cut it into coins, put some mycelium in between it, you restack it, it glues it back together, and you get mushrooms sprouting on your side. It's really cool. Uh, other varieties we talked about, wine caps, are something I tried for the first year this year. Um, there are different species, Tropharia is the species, but if you're a gardener and you use wood chips outside, throw some of those in there and <laughs> get some free mushrooms. I had some for the first time this year. I can't say they're the best mushrooms I've ever had, but they're pretty good. Um, they're type, they're related to the button mushroom, but for the cost of some spraying spawn, put it in there, let it grow. Um, I had to buy the mulch anyway, and something's going to eat the mulch, so it might as well be something that I can eat. And so they surprised me this fall. Uh, they will pop up, and so when you least expect it after a rainstorm or something, so they go over quickly, just like any other mushroom. And it took me two or three flushes before I got any that were at the proper stage to hurt, because I kept messing them. Shiitake logs, Sue's going to talk about some other types of mushroom projects. Specifically for this, though, so Sue and I have been involved with this, uh, this mushroom educator program at Cornell, which Steve Gabriel has been the fellow hosting that. And Cornell has some pretty great resources. There is a full online course for mushroom growing through the Cornell Small Farms program. Penn State Extension, uh, like I said, most of the, the button mushrooms are grown in Pennsylvania. And the Penn State folks have been on top of this for quite a while. Um, although most of their stuff, again, is the like species. So Cornell's coming up on them for that. The, we're, we're, we may exceed their mushroom cultivation. Also, there is the American Mushroom Institute as well. And as much as I hate referring people to YouTube, there are some legitimate sources on YouTube with some good growing information and growing but you need to be very selective about what you watch because there's a lot of garbage and outright misinformation on here too. So fresh cap mushrooms is one, growth cycle. Um, for foraging, there's a guy out of Penn State that's a trained mycologist and does a series called Learn Your Land. And uh, he gives a hint on foraging mushrooms. Um, we don't teach mushroom foraging and we don't do identification although I personally forage mushrooms. The, in New York State, if you want to sell foraged mushrooms, you do have to pass an exam and get a certificate to do so. 
So that's one thing to keep in mind if you're interested in foraging or we don't really have morels around here too much, but the uh, end of the woods or something like that, um, you do need that to sell like farmer's markets. And I would advise, like Sue said, going with someone who's experienced with that. So um, that is my spiel. Any other questions on growing? Sue's got a, some slides to talk about, and then we'll jump into the fun stuff. All right. Moving on. Let me find your slides. Not oh, right. It's right here. It's up here. You just oh, it's number, too far. number 15. All Next right. one. There we go. Okay, so um, there are other things you can do at home besides oyster mushrooms. And um, oyster mushrooms are going to be probably the quickest way to go. Some of these other things take a little bit more time. Go to the next slide, Mike. Yeah, let me share the screen. Oh, okay. Thanks a lot. All right. There we go. Okay. Okay. So shiitake mushrooms, I'm sure we prefer these. These you can grow yourself. Um, shiitake mushrooms do not grow in the wild. They're only produced via cultivation. Now, don't ask me the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg, because I don't know. But they're only produced in cultivation. And they're the third most common cultivated mushroom in the world. So again, the nutritional benefits, they're high in a protein that's ideal for humans, uh, easy for humans to digest, lowers cholesterol, high in B vitamins, and then high in all these, uh, these elements, manganese, phosphorus, potassium, selenium, copper, and zinc. And they're delicious. <laughs> And, and again, just like all other mushrooms, there's some of the immune um, and anti-cancer benefits to them also. So you can grow them at home. Shiitakes are usually grown on logs. Now you can buy kits with the substrate. You can grow them on a little block. But if you want to grow them outside at home, logs are the best way to go. But you need certain logs, you need certain species and you need certain sizes. You need logs that are three to four foot long and about four to eight inches in diameter. And they need to be freshly cut two to three weeks after cutting. The species that shiitake like the most are maple, beech, oak, and hornbeam. Now, they have to have intact bark, so they can't be trees that are decaying or anything like that. Now, you may say, I'm just gonna cut down a tree to grow mushrooms. People who have forest property cut down trees that are going to be thinning anyway. So that's a way to use up those trees that they're thinning out. So I don't want you to think that we're, you know, promoting people to just write some cut down trees. Yes, it? but they're delicious. Yeah. <laughs> they're worth it. Mike, we understand where you're coming from. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so people use it as a part of their forest management practices. So what they do, and I'm going to have pictures of this shortly, you drill holes into the logs, a series of holes, you put shiitake spawn in the holes, and then there's a special tool that you pack it in there with, and then you put a wax over the top of the, um, the, the spawn after it's been in there. And basically what that does, that keeps bacteria out, keeps critters from getting in there, and then you place logs in a shady area and you wait for what is called the spawn run. Basically what that is, is that white mycelium that develops, white mycelium that you see in there. And about, I think it's four to six weeks. Can you go to the next one, Mike? Uh, well, yeah. Okay, the spawn run is gonna take six to 18 months. This is a long-term thing. Uh, what you'll see on the, if you look at the logs on the end, you'll see white mycelium. When that appears, the spawn run is done or mostly complete. Then you have to soak 
the log. You have to shock the log. So for 24 hours, and this stimulates fruiting. And the best way to soak it is in cold water. And what a lot of people do is if they have a pond or maybe a animal trough, some sort that it's clean, throw the logs in there. I have a pond on my property. I just tied a rope around it, threw it out there. I say, hold it back in. And then you put them in a shady area, stand them up, and you get fruit within two weeks. And then you can harvest them. So, I, and I can't stress what Mike said enough. You have to catch these guys. You have to check every day. Do you forget a day? I had one of these buckets in my basement, like the ones that Mike showed. And I went down there and they were, I could see them coming out. I thought, oh, these are going to be beautiful. And then I forgot about them, went down two days later. They hit, they were past their prime and there were tons of them. So you've got to check every day. This happens very rapidly. And a log, after you harvest them, generally with a log, you cut it off, put the mushrooms off with a knife. Then the log has to rest for six to eight weeks, and then it will flush. Again, you go through the same process. And one log will last two or three years. So you can do this over and over. Yes, ma'am. What happens with a wax tail? Um, that once the mushrooms come out, it works its way through. Yeah, it works its way through and it'll flush again. So if you want to go to the next slide, Mike, um, and like I said, you can also grow these on kits, on sawdust block kits that you can order through places like Field and Forage. Yeah, just to point out real quick. So the sawdust thing that we're talking about with oysters, it's the exact same process. You exclude contaminants, you exclude all the bark, excludes the contaminants, you use a fresh thing. So the processes are identical. The big difference is this is chopped up in little tiny pieces. They eat it real fast. A log takes a long time to digest, and they're going to pop out where the cracks are. Sorry, sir. That's okay. Okay, so here's some pictures. Here they are. Here we are drilling holes in a log, and you need a pretty heavy duty um, drill. And I think the size that you, I think it's half inch. This is, happens to be a plug of spawn. It fits right in the hole. Sometimes they have just loose spawn. You have a special tool and you can pack it right into the hole. But you drill holes in a diamond pattern around the circumference, about four to six inches apart. And here they are putting the wax seal. And there's the mycelium you see at the end of the spot. Here they are, here are the logs soaking. And there's your two shots. Okay. Here they are, they are very pretty. And we do have several growers for shiitake in the area. There's a couple in Philadelphia that's doing that, uh, and another one in Natural Village. So they're doing natural log shiitake with one maple and so on. And they are selling very well. So actually that's obviously a lot more work, takes more time, and you have to have the forest property, you have to have the wood to grow them on. Mike mentioned Sterphoria or wine cap mushrooms. They do grow wild throughout North America. They're very, very attractive in their color. Um, they grow on wood chips, and like Mike said, you got wood chips in your garden. You can cut, you can inoculate that. They're super easy to grow. Um, and they tend to grow quicker some of the other mushrooms. And yeah, no, you can go to the next one. Um, so you can have an area that's in partial shade. You don't want full sun beating down on these. You need at least four square feet. That's the critical mass, at least that much. And you expose, you remove the organic matter, expose the bare soil, put down your, your material, your inoculating material, you go to the next one. And you just layer sawdust spawn, sawdust spawn, wood chips on top or straw, and then you water it thoroughly. And then just, just wait. Now you have to remember that you're doing this outside, so it's not a sterile environment. So you may have possibly some other things that come up. 
So make sure you know what the stuphoria or the wine cap look like. And once that's colonized, that area is going to fruit for, for many years. Harvest. You know, there's going to be a period in between where it rests, and then you can harvest more. Yeah, the spore print on these is like this weird purple color. So I actually had those this year, and I did do a spore print. Because I went through all the ID and I was pretty sure what they were, but it's kind of like, uh, I don't want to get sick. So I did do a spore print and they really just fill the plate or whatever with this dust within a couple of minutes. It's not that hard to do. Do the spore print. It's well worth the time. Another one um, that you can grow at home, and usually you, you grow this and you buy a kit, you grow it on a sawdust block. And this is one of the ones that I did at home. It's called lion's mane. It's also called a tooth fungus or a bearded fungus. And this is what it looks like in the wild. So, you, know, you can see it throughout the US. Um, you can go to the next slide, Mike. It grows on beach, maple, and oak, which guess what? We're an eastern deciduous forest, beach, maple, oak. Um, the flavor of the mushroom is akin to seafood or lobster. That's why people like it. And here's some that I had harvested. I'm sauteing on my stove there. Um, you have to use it right away. Very short storage life. It's used in Chinese medicine. It stimulates nerve growth and improves cognitive ability. So that's why there's a lot of, uh, a lot of good excitement and press on lion's mane because of that cognitive um, thing going on there. So how many do they grow? Okay, there's a picture right there of some that I grew. Now again, you have to stay on top of these. If you don't, they'll turn like almost like sort of like a yellow color, and then they're past their prime. And I had a really big one. It was like about this big that I grew off of a sawdust block like this. Unfortunately, I didn't get a picture of it. But um, and it did start to turn yellow around the edges. And I was not going to throw it out, so I just cut that part up and make the rest. Um, you can also produce these outdoors on totems, where a log is sliced into cookies. You layer the log in the spawn, that's a totem. And in this case, you need big logs, 10 to 12 inches in diameter, but shorter, about a foot long. They take 18 months to clean. So this is the longest of all of them. If you're going to do this outdoors, if you're interested in lion mage, you're better off just giving it a kit, trying it, see if you like it, and go from there. There's some pictures of some that are, these are sawdust blocks right here. There's a totem. There's the lion's mane shooting out of the totem. And I wanted to pass around this book too. Um, this is called Farming in the Woods. And it's got a really good chapter on shiitake mushrooms and growing mushrooms outside. This is by Steve Gabriel. Um, Mike mentioned him earlier. He's the Cornell guru on mushrooms. Um, and the, this has got a lot of good information. So I'll pass that around. And I think that's it. So anybody knows kind of a quick and dirty traditional <laughs> options that you can do beyond what we're going to do now. So any questions? It seems odd that you go through a lot of the sterilization process, but yet they go wild. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. And that's why a lot of people overemphasize that. So it depends on how much risk level you take. Yeah. Some logs outdoors will become contaminated. Other things will grow. So it's just depends on the environment, depends on the substrate. Um, we, we add more nitrogen. So like those corn stalks to it, they're gonna grow better. You're gonna get nicer mushrooms, but other things are gonna come in. Whereas a log doesn't have a lot of nitrogen. Right, yeah. just like um, so, there's not going to be a lot of competition. So it just depends on what you have. Yeah, it's how we train that you're using. Mm -hmm. um, I did oyster mushrooms in a tote. I tried the tote method. It was probably about 
this big and you know tilt like that. I put the I use the pellets that was wet, put them in, did my layering, put a lid on it, put holes in the top. I cleaned it with alcohol before I used to wash it. I cleaned it. I did it in my basement, but I did put gloves on before I handled everything. And I tried it two times, and both times it got evil food and contamination in it. And I think what did we decide, Mike? Maybe maybe that it was too much. Too much open space. In the top yeah, the yeah, that's what we decided. That things had gotten in there. So you have to kind of experiment. You'll have failures and you'll have successes. It's like you need too much surface area. Yeah, so think yeah. of a big yeah. toad that's this big, yeah. filled with pellets, and there's airspace. Oh, um, uh, yeah. So oh, yeah. in so the basement, things floating around. Yep. All right. So I guess we can move on. Yeah, so let's. Um, Let's do a bag, put it together. Um, you guys are welcome to plant your own bags, but I encourage you to do that at home. And uh, that way you can play with other things, coffee grounds or whatever. So if you want to, we'll go through it. Kind of up to you guys what you want to do with your kits. Um, but you can take your time and go home. So we have stuff ready here. Some wood pellets that, uh, Get, um, some water. I think I want to do the house. I want to add pellets of water. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, how much water and pellets? So they're saturated. These pellets would do a whole lot. So the first time I did it in a bucket, after I after my failed pump method, I did it in a bucket, and then I did get um, some mushrooms. But these, you have to cut it. So, and warm water is going to work better. Mm -hmm. Absorb that pressure. That's a risk. So. Let's do white ones. Very good. Very good. Or just like what you buy. What you buy? Yeah, we have a power stove. Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to want to be yeah. in our power stove, and Mike and I we bought a couple and we had in the office. And as you can see, it's already so. Yeah, well, you guys can warm. come up if you're comfortable. Yeah, if, if you're not, that's fine. We're going to gather around. So, well, how much did you start out with for the so five gallons? Yeah, I should have shown you. That was about that much. So, about a quarter of a bucket for Yeah, time. and as you can see, it's already okay. yeah. starting to soak some of this up. And the pellets are beginning. Gotta keep your hands out of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you pay attention. How long, yeah. long does it take for it to like, expand? I guess you know. It, how much it didn't that. take it long didn't at all. I would, yeah. done, yeah. I would say 15, 20 minutes. And of course, I had gloves on, but I was, you know, boiling and helping yeah. it along. But it did. It does take. It's a you when you look at the pellets, the raw plain pellets, which is so hard. And they were actually going out. You sure wouldn't that. think that they would absorb as quickly as they do. I thought I was going to have my bucket sitting around yeah. for half a day, yeah. and, you know, and it was it was it's super fast. Nice. Yeah, you can see these are already. Yeah, look at how much yeah. they're starting to break yeah. up and puff up. Um, so when they make these, they are literally putting them through an extruder, pressing them, that brings them up to like 300 degrees or something like that. No. <laughs> Completely sterilizes them, and the lignin binds together, which is what other pellets Um, But as soon as you give water, those cell walls <coughs> yeah. and can come back open. So the, what we did in the office, all right, oh. I did it before we had played <laughs> with those too much. So I did them in one of these bags, and it quickly turned into a snowman. Oh. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it, was, it was just bulging, and it was sitting yeah. in our soil lab. And it was the most nasty looking thing. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it wasn't bad. Um, it did grow, though, but because it was so compressed, because the bag still was holding it in quite a bit, um, that the mycelium never really made its way. Oh. Really is, it, is, is that the one that got real smelly? Like, that's yeah, we, yeah, because it wasn't able to grow. Yeah, we, oh, wow, that yeah, was crazy. So. Yeah, um, it's like grape Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it does. I don't know. Yeah, grape nuts would work. And we need more water, Mike. 
Look at this. Oh, look it's at that. It's already, it's already absorbed all the water and it's still kind of dry. Okay, I'll go this. So, what, the pallets, can they be mixed? Are they made out of mixed woods? Yeah, hardwood. Hard just pallets. Are they just hardwood pallets? Yeah, they're what you would put in a pallet stove. They come in, I think it's 40 or 50 pound bags. There's no hide in it. Is there? Is it mixed woods? I think it's hardwood. Just hardwood? Yeah. Okay. So um, this, how much more water are you going to put in that? Well, if, if you look at it now, and I would give everybody spoons, so it's going to make it less. Is there a trash can around here? What does it look like a fixed oatmeal? Yeah, I don't okay. see it breaks down like an oatmeal. Do you know what it is? Oh, yeah. And I'm going to throw this out. If you guys want to touch it, go ahead. No. <laughs> Oh, yeah. See, that's just it's not quite there yet. Right. Yeah, you can tell when you just. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You okay. can see it's kind of turn, turning to sawdust. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I don't even know where the camera is. Way up there. That's not going to happen. So if I, if I take, if I touch this, yeah, it's dry. So very dry. So we need we need more water, and we're already we're already up to here. Oh wow! Oh yeah. So yes. So again, like I said, warning. You know, start out with just a little bit because I had mine overflowing and I was scooping it out, um, trying to find um, trying to make more room for the expansion. Yeah, it's not quite there yet. There's still pellets that are that are still in here. See that there's pellets in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where he went, but nice tea. Not sure if I was able to be super deep in here. Oh, here we come. Oh, water. You guys have any more questions before we turn off the recording too? Otherwise, let's play. You want to leave that on for the other people to see?